Okay, well, I can turn off my sound here. Okay, so good evening. Good to see you guys again. So uh, this is our uh, week number four, and uh, we've covered quite a bit. And just kind of to recap, the first class we had talked about uh, did Jesus exist? What does history have to say about uh, was he a historical figure? And kind of using what historians use when they're seeing if anyone existed, using the same thing to show that he did exist. Second week, we looked at his death and evidence for his resurrection and looking at people who didn't believe that he died, sorry, who didn't believe he rose again, looked at the evidence and were converted. Uh, last week, we looked at uh, what do we put our faith in? Do we put our faith in Trump and Obama? Do we put our faith in the Bible? Do we put our faith in anything other than Jesus? Uh, and now tonight, we're going to be looking at, or the title is Reject or Receive. And there's only two options when it comes to Jesus. We can either reject him or receive him. There's no kind of in between. You halfway reject, you halfway receive. So tonight, we're going to be looking at what do we do uh, with Jesus personally. So I'm going to start, show a clip here uh, from the Gospel of John. Let me share my screen. Stop grumbling among yourselves! People cannot come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them to me. And I will raise them to life on the last day. The prophets wrote, everyone will be taught by God. Anyone who hears the Father and learns from him comes to me. This does not mean that anyone has seen the Father. He who is from God is the only one who has seen the Father. I am telling you the truth. He who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the desert, but they died bread that comes down from heaven is of such a kind that whoever eats it will not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If you eat this bread, you will live forever. The bread that I will give you is my flesh, which I give so that the world may live. This started an angry argument. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? I am telling you the truth. If you do eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will not have life in yourselves. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them to life on the last day. For my flesh is the real food, my blood is the real drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood live in me, and I live in them. The living Father sent me, and because of him I live also. In the same way, whoever eats me will live because of me. This, then, is the bread that came down from heaven. It is not like the bread that your ancestors ate, but then later died. Those who eat this bread will live forever. Jesus said this as he taught in the synagogue in Capernaum. Many of his followers heard this and said, This teaching is too hard. Who can listen to it? Without being told, Jesus knew that they were grumbling about this. Does this make you want to give up? Suppose then that you should see the Son of Man go back up to the place where he was before. What use life is God's spirit? Human power is of no use at all. 
The words I have spoken to you bring God's life-giving spirit. And some of you do not believe. Jesus knew from the very beginning who were the ones that would not believe and which one would betray him. This is the very reason I told you that no people can come to me unless the Father makes it possible for them to do so. Because of this, many of Jesus' followers turned back and would not go with him anymore. And you? You also like to leave. Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. And now we believe and know that you are the only one. I chose the twelve of you, didn't I? Yet one of you is a devil. He was talking about Judas, a son of Simon Iscariot. For Judas, even though he was one of the twelve disciples, was going to betray him. So uh, a pretty intense uh, uh, time for Jesus. And this was right after he had fed the 5,000. And uh, they came, they wanted to talk to him. They were interested in what he had to say. But did, they, did the majority receive his message or reject his message there? Reject. They rejected. There's only, only his disciples were left. Um, and the question is, you now if we were there at that time, if we were Jews, you know, understanding the way we understood how things were, would we have received or rejected him? And even now in 2019, you know, do we receive or reject Jesus? And sometimes what Jesus has to say uh, can be quite hard. So um, here is out of John. I'll share my screen again. And this is in John chapter 1. It says, but all who did receive him who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So we need to receive Jesus, you know, and what does that mean to receive him? And tonight, I'd really like to take some time talking about, do we receive Jesus wholeheartedly, or do we have our barrier up? Is there things in our mind that kind of are obstacles of us really 100% freely coming to Jesus? Are we receiving him as God has asked us to? So um, we're going to look at some verses here. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. So I know for me, for a, for a lot of my discipleship, that I felt that by honoring Jesus, I in some way was dishonoring the Father. And, you know, in John 5, 22, says, whoever does not honor the Son, you don't honor the Father. So if I'm not on, you know, if I want to give honor and glory to God, and I'm not doing that to a son, I cannot honor God. There's, it's impossible for me to honor God if I'm not honoring Jesus. And uh, he goes on to say, For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son. And here's the question. How much are we to honor the Son? And here's the qualifier. Just as they honor the Father. And, and maybe that, that makes you feel uncomfortable. It made me feel very uncomfortable. You know, reading that, because I, I, in my mind, I was like, yeah, God is here in Jesus. You know, I, I can honor Jesus this much, but I got to honor God this much. And here in John is saying, I need to honor Jesus equivalent to the level as I would honor God. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. And what in John here, in this verse here, you know, when the king would give his seal of approval, that means he's signing off on. And here God has sealed or has signed off on Jesus. Another verse in 1 Peter, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. So again, everything you know, from the angels to mankind to us, all of us, everything God has put in subjection to Jesus. 
And what is that? What is this maybe uh, ring a bell to the Old Testament? Who was someone that gave all authority to somebody else in the Old Testament? Anyone pop into mind? In Genesis? I forgave. In the Old Testament? Yeah, the Old Testament Genesis. Who was somebody that gave someone all authority in a certain particular area? Potiphar gave Joseph. Excellent. Jo Potiphar gave Joseph over his house. And then after that, who did the next person do? Pharaoh. Pharaoh. So Pharaoh gave Joseph all command, which said nobody could buy or sell in all of Egypt unless Joseph said it was okay. So if you came into Egypt, did you talk to Joseph? Sorry, did you talk to Pharaoh? You talked to Joseph. You had a deal with Joseph. That's what Pharaoh had set up, and it's the same thing. God has set his son as the one that everything now has been subject unto Jesus. Right. Here's another great verse. The Father will honor him, and to the glory of God the Father. So who, you know, who here wants God to honor them, and also who wants to give glory to God? How can we do that? How can I honor God and give glory to God? to God. It says, if anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. And then, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to glory to God the Father. So again, in my mind, I used to think there was this competition, that you had God, and you had Jesus, and I had to be careful that I didn't esteem Jesus, because if I do that, I'm dishonoring God. Or if I kneel and confess Jesus as Lord, I'm dishonoring God. But it's the complete opposite. I can't give glory to God. I can't honor God unless I follow and I'm subject to his son. Another verse. God raising him from the dead means everything his son said and did was true. So the, the fact that God raised Jesus from the dead means that everything Jesus said and did was true. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Right? It has to be. God would, I mean, he would have sinned. If, he, if Jesus said something that was wrong, he would have sinned. If he did anything, so everything that Jesus said and did, so when we're reading these verses in John, are 100% uh, true. So here's kind of a negative. You know, the wrath of God remains on him. Obviously, nobody wants the wrath of the Father on him. And what does John say the wrath of God will be on who? Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Powerful of the consequences of not receiving, not obeying uh, the Lord Jesus. Not only will he not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. For he who God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. So again, you know, over and over in John, we see this message of, you know, God sent Jesus, God loves Jesus, and God expects everybody to obey his Son 100%. Uh, we read this verse last week. Uh, it says in Revelation chapter 3, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and eat with him and he with me. And that's a present, and that's present, that's right now. Jesus in all our lives is knocking on the door. And the question is, do we open the door? You know, do we kind of keep the door shut? Maybe we feel we don't need him. Maybe we feel like we might in some way be dishonoring the Father. But Jesus stands at the door, and he knocks, and he knocks, and he knocks. It might be he's been knocking for 10 years, 20 years, 50 years. Jesus wants to come into our life and wants to eat with us and abide with us. Romans chapter 10. You know, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. And, you know, for me, this was one of those verses that you might, I might, it might as well as not even existed because I was very hesitant because you know, a lot of Christians would just say they confess Jesus as Lord. And um, 
you know, to be different, I kind of didn't recognize this verse for what it is. And the question I had to ask myself, did I openly confess with my mouth Jesus to be my Lord to those around me, to my family, to my friends? Now, if, if you were to ask my friends, have you ever heard Todd confess that Jesus was his Lord? So am I confessing, you know, not, not in my mind, but in both my mouth, do I confess Jesus my Lord? And then also, do I believe in my heart that God's raised him from the dead? Meaning, do I believe that he's alive? Do I believe in my heart, not just saying it, but do I really believe that God has raised Jesus from the dead? Uh, and uh, this is out of Colossians 3, wives, submit to your husbands as, as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily, as for the Lord, not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You know, so for years I read this, and I was always thinking when reading it that this is God. You know, wives submit to your husbands as fitting to God. Husbands love your wives. Children obey your parents and everything, for this pleases the Lord. And in the, in the last verse here, let's see if it goes. There you go. It says, as you are serving the Lord Christ. So for me, kind of like the uh, scales came off my eyes is that 95% of the time when we read Lord in the New Testament, it's Jesus, it's not God. Jesus has been given, once he's been ascended, the title of Lord. So when you're reading, you know, Colossians 3, you know, wives, you submit to your husbands because that's what Jesus would expect you to do. Children, obey your parents and their name, for this pleases Jesus. Uh, bond servants, earthly masters, you know, fearing Jesus. Again, over and over and over, this idea that we're serving the Lord Jesus. And when we're serving Jesus, we're automatically serving God because God has put his son in that position. Uh, again, out of Romans 10, for with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. The scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. So again, here is Jesus is the one. He's the Lord of all in Romans 10 here. And he bestows his riches all who call on him. And the question is that, do we call on Jesus? Is he, do we, is he saying he'll bestow the riches on all who call on him? For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How are they then going to call on Jesus or on him if they have not believed him? How are they to believe in him if they've not heard him? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. The good news of you know, calling on, on the Lord Jesus. A power, this is out of uh, 1 Corinthians 12. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus Lord except in the Holy Spirit. So here's uh, another verse. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, and, you know, maybe for men, for a guy to love another guy, a little, sometimes maybe it's a bit more uncomfortable than women. You know, guys don't go around saying, oh, I love you. I uh, but what are the consequences if we do not love the Lord Jesus? In 1 Corinthians, it says, let him be accursed. And I didn't even know this verse existed, I think, for about two or three years ago. I knew the verse in Galatians 1, 6, that if anyone preached any other gospel, let him be accursed. Even if an angel from heaven come and preach another gospel, let him be accursed. But it's equivalent to if we do not love Jesus, we're cursed. It's anathema. It's, not, it's really not a worse situation to be in if we don't love the Lord Jesus Christ. So um, I'm going to throw some verses through here about worshiping Jesus. 
and he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. That was the blind man uh, here in Matthew 14. And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those that were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Here is disciples. And going to the house, they saw the child with Mary's mother. They fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And behold, Jesus met them and said greetings. And they came, they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. So we have angels worshipping Jesus, the blind man, uh, the disciples, the the wise men, and then again, his disciples here. So the question is, you know, do you feel comfortable in worshiping Jesus? Not worshiping God, but worshiping, bowing to Jesus now in 2019. Do we worship Jesus in our, in our discipleship? Do we feel, well, if I worship Jesus, God maybe doesn't want me to? No one ever worshiped Jesus in the New Testament and was told not to. They were encouraged to. You know, so do I, you know, do I honor Jesus just as I honor the Father? These are questions that I need to reflect on. Do I honor Jesus just as I honor the Father? You know, do I consider myself subjected to Jesus? Will I open the door to Jesus' voice when he's knocking? Do I serve and follow Jesus? Now, do I confess Jesus as my Lord? Do I believe in my heart that God raised Jesus? Do I love the Lord Jesus? And do I worship the Lord Jesus? And if the question is no, you know, the good news is that he hasn't come back yet. But if we answer any of those questions no, we need to ask ourselves, why don't we? And are we asking Jesus to open up our heart to allow us to 100% do all the things that are, are commanded of us to do. Uh, we have mentioned this verse a few uh, weeks ago. You know, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And uh, do, you know, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. The only way we can ever be the children of God is to receive Jesus as God has expected us to. So what I'd like to do, again, is uh, watch the clip, um, and we'll come back to this. Actually, maybe not, not yet. Let me do, we're not there yet. Let's do this. I'm gonna try to pull this up. I didn't write down the passage. Okay, so Luke 24. And this is when uh, his disciples were on the road to Emmaus. And it says, they urged him strongly saying, stay with us for it's towards evening. The day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. So here is that the Lord Jesus, he accepts invitations. He, they urged him saying, will you stay with us? And he did. And the question is, do we ask Jesus to be with us? Have we ever asked Jesus, you know what? We, I'd really like for you to be with me in this moment, in this time. And, you know, it says Jesus is the, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he accepted the invitation to stay with them. Here's Luke out of Luke 24, 29. Um, this is in John chapter 4. It says, Many Samaritans from that town believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. For she said, He told me all that I ever did. So, he, so when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there for two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It's no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. And after the two days, he, de 
he departed. So here are the Samaritans who the Jews despise, they look down upon. And here are the Samaritans ask Jesus to stay, and he stays for two days. So he stayed with the disciples for two days, or he stayed with them. Here they ask for him to stay, and he stays. So Jesus accepts invitations. And behold, a woman who had suffered from a, just a discharge of blood for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she said to herself, if I only touch his garment, I will be made well. And Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. So here is this woman who for 12 years, you know, had this problem. She probably went to go, she saw every doctor. And here she is crawling on her on her knees saying if i just if i could only touch jesus i'll be made well and she was made well because of it so i'm just going to watch again uh john chapter six and if you want to follow along it's the middle of john six you know jesus is talking that you know, we need to come to him if we want to have life People cannot come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them to me. And I will raise them to life on the last day. The prophets wrote, everyone will be taught by God. Anyone who hears the Father and learns from him comes to me. But this does not mean that anyone has seen the Father. He who is from God is the only one who has seen the Father. I am telling you the truth. He who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the desert, but they died. Bread that comes down from heaven is the kind. And whoever eats it will not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If you eat this bread, you will live forever. The bread that I will give you is my flesh, which I give so that the world may live. This started an angry argument among them. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? I am telling you the truth. If you do not eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will not have life in yourselves. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them to life on the last day. For my flesh is the real food, my blood is the real drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood live in me, and I live in them. The living Father sent me, and because of him I live also. In the same way, whoever eats me will live because of me. This, then, is the bread that came down from heaven. It is not like the bread that your ancestors ate but then later died. Those who eat this bread will live forever. Jesus said this as he taught in the synagogue in Capernaum. Many of his followers heard this and said, This teaching is too hard. Who can listen to it? Without being told, Jesus knew that they were grumbling about this. Does this make you want to give up? Suppose then that you should see the Son of Man go back up to the place where he was before. What gives life is God's spirit. Human power is of no use at all. The words I have spoken to you bring God's life-giving spirit. And some of you do not believe. Jesus knew from the very beginning who were the ones that would not believe. 
and which one would betray him. This is the very reason I told you that no people can come to me unless the Father makes it possible for them to do so. Because of this, many of Jesus' followers turned back and would not go with him anymore. And you? Would you also like to leave? What? To whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. And now we believe and know that you are the only one. So in, in that um, account there, you know, when Jesus is saying to the Jews, you have to eat my flesh, drink my blood, it says when many of his disciples heard, they said, this is a hard saying, who can listen to it? And under the law, they had the right to say, you know, they, they couldn't eat anyone's flesh, they weren't getting it. And then Jesus says, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling, he says, do you take offense to this? And then verse 62, what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? He's like, he just turned it up a notch. He's saying, you're having a problem with this. What if I was to tell you I was to go back to where I was before? And it says at that point, um, it says in verse 66 of John 6, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So they were actually considered disciples, and it says that they no longer walked with him. And a question for all of us is, do we have any excuses of maybe why we don't walk with Jesus? You know, do we come up with our own reasoning? Well, you know, I don't agree with certain things that he said. I don't believe it. Well, I'll, I'll just follow God. I'll just read the Bible. I'll just do it my own way. You know, are there any reasons of why we don't 100% give ourselves over to Jesus? Because a lot of people had the pro had a lot of people who should have known better had a big problem with it. Um, so, uh, yeah, the question is, I guess, for this week is, are we going to receive Jesus wholeheartedly or are we going to reject him? And a lot of times the message of receiving Jesus can be difficult and people found it difficult 2,000 years ago. So um, that's all I have for tonight's class. I guess I'd like to open it up. Any questions, thoughts, uh, or I can close with a prayer. Well, that, that woman at the well uh, uh, section there in John, in John 4, I've heard some people... Like, even though like the act, the Samaritan said it's not because of it's not because of what you told us, but we've seen it ourselves. Seems uh, that's terrible paraphrasing. I'm sorry, but um, but I've heard some people say that in some ways she was one of the, and some of that was one of God's ways. Like if she went back and told the Samaritans what Jesus had done for her, and that was kind of like she was like, well, that was like an early example. She she was preached she preached the gospel to them. Does that does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. Yep. Yeah. Is it because they say that? Well, it's not because of something you said. I think that kind of goes back also to when, like, uh, a little bit where, you know, like, well, in these times, in those times, and some, unfortunately today, but in some parts of the world, you know, women are not considered like reliable witnesses, or they were not considered reliable witnesses back then. And I think that's a lot, kind of anyway, the same reason that Jesus manifested himself first to Mary Magdalene after he was resurrected. It was another way of God using women in his ministry, uh, and showing, yeah. teaching uh, well, the whole world really that way. That he loved women as, as much as he did men. It was part of his creation, you know, his workmanship. But that, anyway, that was a. Uh, yeah, yeah. She, God, it was this. Not only was she a Samaritan, but she was a woman. To your point, and uh, she was one of the first converts to Jesus. Was the Samaritan woman. And a lot of times the, the people who we would say, oh, they would never have a shot. They have, there's no hope for that person. It's the complete opposite. And uh, how dare we ever judge people being uh, you know, unworthy of hearing the message of Jesus. Right. And I just think it's amazing. Because more like that. I heard some preachers talk about, well, I guess when Christ, Jesus was like the, the first advocate for women's rights and the first advocate for civil rights. <laughs> You're right. 
by the way, he said whosoever. You know, he didn't say whosoever is from here or from there or from man or woman or, or black and white. He said whosoever. And, and Amen. Said, yeah. and, uh, and I just think that one thing, that, like uh, as far as the Trinity, uh, I, you know, that word is not in the Bible, but Psalm 2. I've, I've heard another teaching where they say that uh, I guess Psalm 2 is like actually a, a three way uh, conversation between the, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because I, I guess we're in Psalm 2, verse 3, when it says us, I guess in the Hebrew it actually takes three to make a plural, but in English it takes only it takes two. But anyway, I just think that's um, it's amazing how much, well, in, in those times when Jesus was walking, like uh, people refused to uh, believe on him, but they had all, like, all the signs were in the scripture that they were, um, would be able to pull it anyway. Um, I was thinking, Pat, that um, Jesus is the Son of God. You know, he's like, God is the King of Kings, and Jesus is his Son, like this great Prince that if we were in his presence, we would, you know, obey and worship and confess that he is the Son of the King, and you know, so it's a a powerful thing that he, even when he was not yet made immortal, even then people saw, because he's the son of God. I mean, that makes it him this exceptional being, person, um, that people should take note of. And it would have been a hard thing for people like that movie show to accept when he just looked like a package of every other guy that you see on the street. But it was his teaching and his presence and his miracles that should have convicted and convinced and did convince a lot of people that he was exceptional. He was a great prince, even though he wasn't wearing worldly robes and crowns and Gold chains kind of thing. Exactly. No, and they didn't, and they said to him, we're not rejecting you for the miracles that you're doing, but for the things that you say. And Jesus said some things that, again, if we were living during that time, maybe we'd be picking up stones. I mean, because it was a really tough saying to say, listen, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, uh, you know, I and my Father are one. Uh, for them, it was just yeah, anathema for, for him to be saying these things. And we have to just be careful now that we in no way are putting walls or barriers of coming. We need to come to Jesus as if we're coming to the Father. Right? There's no, the same way we come with all open arms to God, we need to come to Jesus. And if we don't, we are dishonoring the Father. There's nothing better that we can put a smile on God's face than to coming to Jesus 100%. clip I think anyway from John 6 but I like for back in like John 6 35 at least in line it says that uh where he says I'm the bread of life he that comes to me shall never hunger and he that believes on me shall never thirst and, and so um I think it's like so like coming to him is like the hunger part it's like just coming to him uh, it's like eating and then believing on him is the yes yep you nailed it that's it like, you see Sorry, what's yeah. your name? What's your name? My name's Robert. Robert? Yeah, yeah. Todd. Yeah, you you, you just I've met anyone over Skype before, but I, I like your teaching and I, I can yeah. tell you. No, you just you just un, you uncoded John six. That that's exactly it. No, he didn't want them to eat their his flesh. That's all they can see. But you, he he said it right there. If you come to him, that's eating his flesh. And what was the other thing you said? If you believe in him, that's the thirst. So if we come and believe in Jesus, we're eating and drinking Jesus. Exactly it. That's what John 6 is all about. I love that because it goes right in with like the John 15 where he says, uh, you know, I'm the vine. He doesn't mean he's actually a piece of botany. You know, like, yep. uh, you know, he's, if you, whoever abided to me and I in him as I abided to the Father and he in me, you know, the same to bring forth much fruit. Because nothing, nothing is possible. Like that kind of, it's the same kind of thing. It's not like a literal, or he said, like, as a good shepherd, he says, I am the door. He doesn't mean he's actually like a plant on a hinge. He, 
anyway. But it, I just, uh, yeah, I appreciate your, your, your class. Yeah. So we gotta come and believe, and it's tough to believe. Again, it's, it's easy to know. It's so easy to know, like knowing the facts about Jesus, but to take this next step to believe that He exists and that He's alive right now. That and that's why I have to constantly, you know, if I, if I was to do like a audit of this past week, you know, have I in every circumstance believed wholeheartedly that Jesus is with me, right? And so when, if if I if I complain, I'm not believing, right? Because if I really believe Jesus is with me and he's allowing certain things to maybe happen, why am I complaining? So I, com I guess the, the level of my complaining is a level of my belief. If I really believe 100% that the Lord Jesus, the author, finisher of my faith, and he is with me, should I be complaining about any circumstance in my life? Never. Oh, Never. Never. Right, but it's, I, I guess I just want you to believe on them though when you catch yourself doing that and you immediately repent. Well, that's the, the idea, I think, because we're always going to be caught in that, that battle. Like, like, like it seems like you know, when, and that's, that's why Paul in Acts 16, when him and Silas are in jail, what are they doing in jail? What are they doing? They're singing. They're singing praises because they believed that Jesus was with them. Like, they, they knew. And then the earthquake happened, and then the and then the jailer, you know, wants to uh, wants to kill himself, and he says, "Don't do that." And Jesus used a horrific circumstance of, of Paul being in jail to bring somebody to Jesus. And in our lives, you know, it's tough when we're going through something horrific, and we're saying, "Where is God?" or "Where is Jesus in this?" And maybe they're there. Where you may be using that, maybe not for us, but for somebody else. And it's hard. It's really hard when we're going through hard stuff in life. Yeah, I was wondering as far as like apologetics and like the, the way like, uh, like the clips from the, like the movie from Lee, uh, Lee Strobel's book and his testimony and stuff. I was wondering about apologetics, you know, like the, uh, the idea of uh, being able to like bring, well, just argue for it, argue his case. And kind of like, I guess anyone who believes him has been given a ministry. So it's kind of and you hear somebody say, oh, I think I've been called to the ministry. It's like, well, if you believe in him, yeah. Like, uh, it's, it's true for all of us. So I just want, do you think it's a kind of negligence to shy away from the apologetics? Like, it, yeah. like, like, uh, or maybe even, you, you say it's the, that it's a sin. Because, I mean, like, God created us and gave us all the things that, the ability to speak, the ability to think, and meditate on his word. And, uh, and like Jeremiah says, you know, the heart is the sequel above all things. You know, the desperately wicked. So it, can't, it is kind of wrong to distrust our feelings and how we feel, but uh, but because because he our feelings are not the Lord. We're supposed to trust in the Lord with all our heart. You know, kind of like, You're right. No, our our feelings are deceptive. Our heart is deceptive, 100. percent So like the whole idea of trusting in the Lord with all our heart and leaning not on our own understanding doesn't mean that uh, we're not supposed to use the brain of God gave us. And, uh, yeah. You're right. Anyway, yeah, so I'm getting ready for a trip with some unbelieving family. So, uh, I appreciate the you're ditching for my arsenal and stuff. So, and, uh, and it, not just them, but you know, for yeah, in this, this fallen world we're living through. So you know, but thanks again, Todd. And I don't yeah. know, I, I just kind of think, yeah, I could, uh, yeah, uncork a, a verse and a question, and we could probably talk all, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, and when it comes to apologetics, like someone can disagree with what we say, but they can't disagree with how we live our life. So if we're showing love and patience and kindness, you can't argue that. So you know, if you're with your family, they might not believe that Jesus is alive. They might think you're crazy, but they cannot argue if they see you changed. If they see Jesus, if they, again, they may not believe in Jesus, but if they see these characteristics of self-sacrifice, of patience, and of love, they can't argue that. And that, that is the greatest witness is our lives. When we leave here and we're at work tomorrow, we're, we're dealing with people that are difficult, maybe people that naturally, like, you know, you don't want to engage with, but if we're, if we're patient, self-sacrificing, praying for them, loving them, like, that's the greatest witness Yeah, I, yeah, I see. Mm -hmm. so.
Yeah, that's an like example that other people have said, like, like that act in a certain way that make you want to be like them, and it comes down to that love of the Christian. So it's like, whoa, whoa. Yeah. kind of uh, yeah. changes everything, thank God. Yeah. It does. But uh, yeah, hey, well, I guess one, uh, another one I was thinking of was like Matthew 16, 19 says, Thou art Peter upon this rock, I build a church, and uh, the gate of hell shall not prevail against it. And it's like, and he goes on, and I give unto you the keys of the kingdom. And, and in Luke 10, where he says, I give you power to trample over the, all the power, uh, uh, powers of serpents and scorpions, and, uh, and things like that. There's so much that he purchased for us on the cross that, that, um, uh, we can, I guess we, we're here to unpack our, you know, throughout our lives, but um, it's just, uh, it's no small thing, of course, we're just celebrating his resurrection, but it doesn't take away from uh, his crucifixion and resurrection. Are kind of, they're not, I, I can't really say that one's more important than the other. Cause, yeah. Because, uh, like, all the guilt and shame and rejection that he felt on the cross, like, compared to any of those things that we've ever felt. It's just overwhelming. Anyway. <laughs> Thanks again, Mr. Linda Black. You got anything? Uh, just Todd. Uh, all right. <laughs> all right. Take the easy way. T O D D. That's it. Any anything else before we wrap? Yeah, I know I missed the class, but I think it's very important to separate the idea of what God thinks about you and what the world thinks about you. So you got to have two separate ideas going on there. They're going to be clashing, and I think you're, you're doing great, and I'm looking forward to doing a lot better myself. Awesome. Amen. I agree with you 100%. So real quick, what does God think about you? Um, well, God loves me <clears throat> unconditionally, um, and he knows my heart and my mind, and he knows, he knows me, all right? And, um, that's scary, isn't it? And, uh, yeah, <laughs> a bit, yeah, it's, it's a bit scary, but, um, he just, he knows me, he's always known me. Yeah. No, he loves us and wants us and he'll walk with us. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. The eyes of the Lord's in every place. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, even though it's scary, I think it's also like part of that best news ever. Like, like, like there's no one, there's nowhere else you can go where it's like, if I could just talk to somebody who knows me or who gets me or somebody who actually knows me better than I know myself. It's like, well, I'm, Jesus, Lord, you know, you know, counts the hairs on our head. Yeah, I'm going to read it. I'm going to read a quote. Someone sent this to me this week. I thought it was pretty good. Let's see. And I, uh, let's see if I can open this up. Okay. So this is the thought to, to think about this week. It says, until and unless there is a person, situation, event, idea, conflict, or relationship that you cannot manage, you will never find the true manager. So God makes sure that several things will come your way that you cannot manage on your own. So... Um, you know, if something comes into our life that we are having a really difficult time managing, the Lord's probably trying to get our attention to make sure we come to him who, who can help us manage it. Yeah. You know, you know he, wants to, he wants to have an intimate relationship with us, though. All right. They, uh, he wants to have an intimate relationship with us. Like, they... I was, someone told me that, um, well, I quit reading the book afterwards, 
but the same word um, as in uh, Adam knew Eve is kind of like the same word they use for God wanting to know us. And so I, I stopped reading the book because, I mean, it's just kind of difficult to think about. But I, I mean, transitionally, I think it's more of, okay, if God is in you, he wants to know you, right? He wants to know you. He, and he, if God is in you, then you're becoming, you become one with, with Christ. Because what you do is not you, it's he who is within you. So the fact of knowing into me see is how they put it. Into me see, right? Because he knows your heart and your mind. So he wants you to know him and he wants to know you. So it, it had nothing to do with the, uh, you know, the other, but into me see. The honesty and, and the love and commitment and, and all those things is, is the way they, is the way it was written. No, he does. He wants, he's, he's closer than we think. And even Paul says that on Mars Hill. He says the Lord is closer to than we really think he is. Okay, well, remember the Lord of hosts? Remember? The Father, the Lord of hosts, and then there's the Son. And so, um, I think you should look at Psalm 25, and, or 24 and 25. Is that my homework for the week? Yeah, <laughs> just look at those two. Where it says, where it says, open up ye everlasting doors. Open up, and the King of glory will come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. So, again, with Christ being, it not being me, it's he who is within me. And so Christ comes through us and speaks through us. So we are everlasting doors, and then the King of glory comes in and speaks through us. And the glory is shown through us and some of us and through all the believers and in the world and to come. Thank you. <laughs> no more homework. Yeah. Well, thank you for the classes that I didn't miss, too. Sorry I missed this one. That's right. So next week's the last one. I'll be... Uh... Calling in from San Diego, I'm going out. To, I'm going to a marketing conference, so I'll have a different background. But uh, next week's the last class, and it's the best one. At least I'm partial to it. It's my favorite one, so I'm saving the best for last. We look forward to it. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Have a great week and safe travels. Yeah. Thanks. I'll I'll close with a prayer and then I'll sh and. Our great God in heaven and our Lord Jesus, thank you for this night. Thank you for technology that we can talk from thousands of miles away. We thank you so much, Father, for your son, Jesus. Help us not to grumble and to murmur and to put roadblocks and obstacles of coming to your son. We pray that we'll come to him wholeheartedly, that we'll come to him with the same honor as we come to you, that we'll come to him freely, that we'll believe on him and we pray, Lord Jesus, that, that as you knock on our hearts, that we will open the door, that we'll come to you, that we'll believe that you are alive, that your Father has exalted you to his right hand, that all things and all people and angels are subjected to you, including us. So we pray as we leave this week that you'll be with us all, that you'll walk with us, that you'll dwell with us, that no matter what we're facing, sin or struggle or temptation and trial, that you're with us and that we might see your hand. And as we lack in faith, we pray that you'll be with us to help and strengthen our faith and encourage our faith. And we pray for that when we sin, that you'll forgive us, that we'll repent and do better. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Lord Jesus. And we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Yeah, have a great week. Yeah. Have a good night. Good night. God bless. Thank you, Chad.